Hello and welcome to another helpful Astro Explanations by Jack. I've called upon the Some Good News team to introduce the topic. They say Jack's made another YouTube video, this time about geo orbits, geosynchronous orbits. Awesome. I'd like to point out this is a not an official Space Force creation, nor is it an endorsement of the Netflix show. It's just me being an enthusiastic and zany teacher. Let's learn about geosynchronous orbits. So who came up with the idea? Well, it's that 2001 Space Odyssey guy. And who's that? It's Arthur C. Clarke. In October 1945, in the Wireless World magazine, he wrote an article, Extraterrestrial Relays, which talked about the geosynchronous orbit concept for radio relays. He benefited from the work of a guy named Herman who in 1929 started work on the idea. So today, what we benefit from is his forethought and vision of a geosynchronous orbiting satellite. Okay, let's look at some of the nifty numbers of geo orbit. There's a lot of them, and you might choose to memorize them and really be cool when you talk to your friends. The orbit period of a geo orbit is 23 hours, 56 minutes, and four seconds. It's not 24 hours. You see, the Earth is going around the sun, and it requires a little more rotation to complete that one solar day. You can also uh, express the period in seconds. 86,164 is a geo orbit. And the mean motion is slightly more than one rev per day. The radius of a geo orbit is 42,164. That's a cool number to memorize. And the altitude above the Earth's surface is 35,786. These are cool numbers to know. So there you have the satellite out at geo, happy sitting over its line of longitude, perhaps at zero inclination, so it's not oscillating up and down. But you want to move around out there. Oh, well, it's not that hard. The magic number is 78. and that is the altitude difference above or below geo where you can induce a one degree per day drift, okay? So if you're above, you'll drift to the west. If you're below, you'll drift to the east, okay? And if you're in the circular orbit at that dimension, okay, below or above. In geo, one degree of arc is about 736 kilometers if you wanna know that in distance. So there you go, the magic number is 78. Actually, the year I graduated from the Air Force Academy. Pretty cool, huh? In track movement, fire up your thrusters. If you wanna do this movement and drift around out there, you've gotta climb or descend and then recircularize. That's not so hard. Two 1.4 meters per second delta Vs separated by 11 hours and 58 minutes. And if you do it right, You've expended 2.8 meters per second, and you're now higher or lower, okay? That's how you get into what's called a drift orbit. Now, orbit plane change has got some cool numbers, and I wanna foot stomp something here. Remember, inclination and right ascension of the ascending node are the two orbit elements that define orbit plane. There's two numbers there. Inclination change, changing the tilt of the orbit, requires 54 meters per second. You do the delta V at the node when you're crossing the equator, northbound or southbound. 54 meters per second is a good rule of thumb. Now, the delta V for doing right ascension change, changing the twist, is a little trickier because it requires you to know what the inclination of the orbit is, and it matters. Here's an example. If we're inclined at one degree and you say, hey, I want to rotate the RAND 10 degrees, well, that's going to cost you 9 meters per second of delta V. So that's not so bad. But if we were at 15 degrees incline and you came up with that idea of a 10 degree RAND change, holy cow, it's 138 meters per second delta V. So really pay attention to what the inclination is. Lastly, orbit plane natural movement. Inclination moves 0.85 degrees per year. It's in a 54 year cycle with an amplitude of 15 degrees, okay? And uh, RAN movement is a little more complicated. And we'll get more into that when we talk about the sun and the moon gravity effects, because they're the forces that are uh, influencing the orbit plane. Let's press on. So the big three orbit perturbations, here they are listed. 
The dominant one is solar radiation pressure. Yep, there's a wind out there, the solar wind, and it does affect the orbit. The Earth's gravity is kind of odd when you're looking at it from geo. It's called triaxiality, okay, the J22 effect. That's where I'll introduce something perhaps new to you, gravity, hills, and valleys. And then there's the sun and the moon tugging on us, the other poles, the other gravity. The earth is the big gorilla, but the sun and the moon play effect. And we're gonna learn about its effect on us, on our orbit. So solar radiation pressure affects the eccentricity and the argument of perigee, okay? So we're gonna look closely at how this happens. I've called upon my friend Richard Osetich, who's an astronautical engineer with SAIC, formerly TASC. And what's really cool is he's a former Air Force Academy astro student of mine, class of 84. He's now my mentor. Richard is like 10 times smarter than I ever was. He's awesome. So he shared a couple of illustrations on this solar radiation pressure that I want you to, to get familiar with. Pay attention to the colors. Here we go. So we're in a circular orbit. And from the left is the solar radiation pressure, the wind coming, okay? So when the spacecraft velocity is parallel to the sun in the blue part down on the bottom, we pick up a little tailwind, a little push. It adds energy to the orbit. Guess what? That's like getting a delta V, okay? But what happens on the far end, half an orbit period later? Well, apogee raises due to that positive delta V. That's really cool. However, when we're up there, we're now going into a solar radiation pressure headwind where the spacecraft velocity vector is parallel to the headwind. The headwind takes energy from the orbit. Now that's like a negative delta V. Look down at the red arrow and the red words, the perigee lowers due to the negative delta V. Holy cow, we're getting a push, apogee raises. We're getting a headwind, perigee lowers. Eccentricity is changing. We are coming out of round. That's just amazing. What else happens? Well, as we journey around the sun, the orientation of the solar radiation pressure makes the orbit uh, argument of perigee swivel. The eccentricity vector makes a full 360 degree circle. So that's another thing to consider. We're out of round and our long axis is rotating. Amazing. Now, let me share with you something cool to know. The spacecraft area to mass ratio sets the limit that the eccentricity will grow. It's not boundless. It reaches a limit, and that limit is a function of the area to mass ratio. Now, for the big honking geo birds like this Theria, they got a lot of things, solar arrays, antennas sticking out. They have a big area to mass ratio. In fact, it can be a problem for them. As you get out of round, you may rock back and forth in your ITU slot which is 0 0.1 degree, about 70 kilometers. So you may get close to your edge and you gotta do station keeping to control this or you'll get in trouble with the ITU. You don't want that. Okay, Earth's gravity. The Earth to a geo bird has some really strange effects and we're gonna learn about that. Of course, it's why we orbit the Earth, but there's some real subtle things that happen. Let's talk about it. So the Earth's gravity field is illustrated here, another chart from Richard. I'm gonna introduce the concept of valleys and hills. Pay attention. This chart and the next one will help you understand. Valleys are high mass concentrations. They're over the Rocky Mountain and the Urals, okay? And that's where the gravity is stronger due to this mass concentration. Hills, less mass concentration, and that's where the gravity is, shall we say, weaker. Okay, so look at this chart and let's now take another perspective of it. So thanks to my friends, Bruce Romney of Lockheed and Mike Powski of Powski and Associates, longtime mentors of mine, and like Richard, a lot smarter than me, they gave me this illustration and I added the stable and unstable bowls. What you see here are the stable equilibrium points there's two of them, and the bowl is right side up. So imagine, that's the valley, okay? If you're not doing east-west station keeping, you will oscillate in that bowl about these stable points. What if you're at the unstable point? Well, that's a hill, right? And what happens is you'll come off the top 
and head over to the stable point, okay? There is situations where you can go back and forth over a 800 day period. It's really complicated motion, but there are stable points and unstable points. And this illustration makes it clear. One more of the big three, sun and moon gravity. They affect inclination and ran. And as you know, that's the orbit plane and a slight effect on our in a perigee. I want to introduce the polar plot. Orbit plane is described by inclination and ran, and the polar plot is used by geo orbit designers and operators to plan and monitor their orbit plane movement and, and planning maneuvers. The concentric circles expanding out our inclination. The clocking angle you see, the ran, is illustrated there. So here's what happens. This is how you decide where in ink and ran space you're going to go with your satellite. And then you can station keep there or let Mother Nature make it move, change the orbit plane, okay? I also added that really nifty illustration I found. Geostationary is zero degrees inclined and geosynchronous is a non-zero. So that, that's the two different word definitions, okay? Hey, let's look at an example of this uh, inclination and random movement. This is again provided by Bruce Romney and uh, Mike Palsky. And what it is, it's a real polar plot of a satellite that flew a while ago. Okay, it started out at 300 degrees ran at five degrees incline there. You can see the beginning of life region. Then over time, about 10 years, it migrated, actually moved through zero and then over to the end of life region where ran is now 75 and it's back out to five degrees. Remember, it's a 54 year cycle. So that motion was caused by the sun and the moon's effect on the orbit plane. Remember, orbit plane is described by inclination and ran. Pretty cool, huh? So we've seen that there's solar radiation pressure, some odd things in the Earth's gravity that cause stable and unstable points, and the sun and the moon play a role in a geosatellite motion. So what's next? Well, let's see what General Naird has to say. He says, we must battle these pesky perturbations that mess with our geo spacecraft. He wants answers now. Well, Snoopy, the famous geo satellite operator, tells him, dial it down, General Naird, if you paid attention to UST and advanced orbit mechanics and the NSDC training, plus listen to good old Jack, you'd know we can use station keeping to keep these perturbations at bay and maintain our mission orbit. After all, Snoopy declares, failure is not an option. So my goal is to create a station keeping uh, helpful explanation and maybe even add some equations so that you can calculate these values. How exciting is that? Thank you for all you do. Thank you for listening. And I hope this ignited your interest in geosynchronous orbits or reaffirmed what you already know. After all, astrodynamics is the domain of Space Force, not the Netflix guys, the real Space Force. God bless you all.